Hi, my name is Brian and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 14. We'll read 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 22. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual morality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices, participants in the altar. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? It's October, which means the scary movies are playing on TV now. Happen to see that after the Clemson game last night. And it reminded me of a Geico insurance commercial from a few years back. Features a group of four terrified young people who are running late one night out of a farm field. And they're trying to escape something or or someone. And they come across this creepy old two-story house with with an even worse looking shed right next to it. Full of chainsaws that are hanging up. And one guy says, Let, let's hide in the attic. And, and one of the girls says, no, 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 let's, let's hide in the basement. And one girl responds, crying, why can't we just get in the running car? And she points over, and, and there's a convertible, cranked, headlights on, running, the top's down, all they got to do is jump in and drive away. As they all look, at the convertible, and then turn back to the girl. One man says, are you crazy? Let's hide behind the chainsaws. (laughs) And they all respond, smart, yeah, okay. (laughs) At which the Geico narrator says, if you're in a horror movie, you make poor decisions. It's what you do. And with a lot of scary movies, not that I'm commending them to you, but they're, they're lampooned so frequently, in part because of an, a very annoying feature in, in most of them, you see the same kind of plot line and the same kind of bad judgment repeated over and over again. At some point, it's, it's like, may, maybe you shouldn't move from the big city out into the country to buy that one house where all the former owners have been disappearing. Maybe you just shouldn't do that. 
Maybe, maybe just don't investigate that creepy sound in the basement. You just want to shake the characters. Have you ever seen a scary movie before? Why are you making these same mistakes? In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is continuing to address the problem of the Corinthian church's participation in idolatry. And in verses 1 to 14, Paul will point the Corinthians and us to the story of Old Testament Israel and ask us, haven't you seen this story before? Why are you making the same mistakes? Shouldn't the repetitive failures of Old Testament Israel warn you against the sin in which you now participate? Paul wants the Corinthians, particularly the knowers, and, and the Lord wants us to see their situation rightly, to see their situation as it is. And in the text, Paul exhorts us to turn from the bad judgments that lead us to forsake Christ and pursue idolatry in order that we might enter the new creation. And it's been a while since we looked at 1 Corinthians, so let's recap the past few chapters. Paul's making one argument in 1 Corinthians 8 to 10, addressing a particular issue. There's a group of Corinthians we've called the knowers, who have the knowledge and understanding that all food is a good gift. Food doesn't commend us to God. Idols don't exist. There's only one God. These knowers are in the idol temples, freely eating food that's been offered to idols, harming another group of saints who Paul describes as those who are weak in conscience. The weak, because of their past association with idols, cannot under any circumstance ever eat food that's been sacrificed in a pagan temple or to idols. The knowers think they have a right to eat idol food in the pagan temple. The weak think it's always wrong to eat idol food regardless of the situation or circumstance. And both groups are mostly wrong. But the knowers are in greater sin. In 1 Corinthians 9, we saw that th this is a core part of Paul's argument. Paul shows how, despite his being an apostle of Christ Jesus, he has intentionally laid down his actual rights, the rights that he does deserve, in order to serve the Corinthians and advance the gospel. Paul had a, a right to financial support from the church. Paul had a right to a wife. Paul had a right to food and drink, but he gave it all up so that he could present to the Corinthians the clearest picture of the free gospel of grace that the Lord gives us in Christ alone. And the spirit-empowered intensity of Paul's gospel focus, we saw at the end of chapter 9, far outpaces Olympic athletes. Singular focus on Christ and Him crucified and making Him known. Paul's overarching aim was to do whatever he could in the power of the Spirit to see the gospel advances to the ends of the earth. And, and that's our responsibility. As Christians in the Great Commission. And Paul is the model for us and for the Corinthians. And as we turn to 1 Corinthians 10, we'll then begin to see why Paul intentionally lays out his mindset, his actions, which are both models for the Corinthians to imitate. Paul describes his new covenant mindset to help the Corinthians see the lengths to which he will go in order to advance God's kingdom and inherit the new creation. Paul has a singular focus, but then you look at the Corinthians and you immediately see double-mindedness. The Corinthians want, want, want Jesus and a little bit of the world. 
They want salvation and, and a little bit of idol worship. They want the Lord's Supper and then a little bit of idol food and drink. They want the glory of the new creation. But they, but they really want some glory in the old creation, this present world too. So Paul gives them a lesson in biblical theology. He's going to look at the overarching story of the Bible and say, we need to learn from Israel's time in the wilderness. So he's going to highlight God's redemption of Israel through the Exodus. He's going to highlight the results of Israel's double-mindedness in their responses to Yahweh's grace because he's trying to win the Corinthians out of sin. Three points this morning. Uh, you, we do have sermon notes in, in the app if you uh, have the app. But three points are this. First, live a redeemed life that pleases God. Live a redeemed life that pleases God. Let's looking at the first five verses. Live a redeemed life that pleases God. Second, Obey God's warnings so that you might live. Obey God's warnings so that you might live. And that one we're going to be looking at verses 6 to 11. Obey God's warnings so that you might live. Third and finally, flee idolatry because God will keep you. Flee idolatry because God will keep you. It's verses 12 to 14. Flee idolatry because God will keep you. All right, first point. Live a redeemed life that pleases God. Let's look at the first five verses again of chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. In this first point, I, I want to look at, at two points that Paul makes for the Corinthians. I wanted to look at more, but I preached too long anyway. I want to look at two points that Paul makes for the Corinthians, as well as the concluding exhortation he implicitly gives them. By looking here. All right, first, Paul wants us to rightly see the story of Israel's redemption. He wants us to see rightly the story of Israel's redemption. That's the first four verses of chapter 10. The people of Israel were brought out of slavery to Egypt through the Exodus. Yahweh the Lord had judged the land of Egypt through various plagues, culminating in the tenth plague where all the firstborn in the land were struck down. Unless, in trusting His promise, you put the blood of an innocent lamb on your doorpost and the destroyer passed over your home and your firstborn lived. Israel was then led by the Lord by cloud, brought safely through the Red Sea. The sea then crushed the Egyptian army that was following them. The people of Israel had been redeemed from slavery by Yahweh. The single greatest redemption story in the Old Testament in Israel's history, the exodus from Egypt, God's redemptive work displayed. Paul uses this imagery of being brought safely through the waters to describe ancient Israel as having enjoyed a baptism into Moses. And, and what he means here is, is a baptism being brought underneath his spiritual leadership and representation before God. Moses was the spiritual leader. Moses was tasked with leading Israel to rest and to life in the promised land. God's people... We're being brought back into God's place by God's man 
in order to enjoy God's rest according to God's promises. Paul wants the Corinthians to remember that God provided Israel food and drink, and this food and drink was ultimately provided through the agency of God's Son, Christ. So the attentive Corinthian saints would understand Paul to be teaching them that Israel at least enjoyed an an analogous baptism and meal. Paul looks back. Israel had a baptism into Moses. Israel enjoyed a spiritual meal from Christ. And the Corinthian saints would be like, wait a minute. I've enjoyed a baptism. I've enjoyed a spiritual meal from Christ. There were numerous similarities between God's redemptive work in Old Testament Israel and His redemptive work within the Corinthian church. That's intentional. We're going to get to that in the second point. So Paul first wants them to see God's redemption of Israel. Secondly, in these five verses, Paul teaches us that despite Israel being redeemed from slavery, despite them enjoying a special baptism and a special meal from Christ, God overthrew Israel in the wilderness because He was not pleased with them. Verse 5. So Paul gives us here a category for God expressing displeasure towards His redeemed people. That really forms the the basis for the, the rest of the warning. Don't live in such a way that you displease uh, displease the Lord and miss the kingdom. Because Israel did. A generation in the wilderness. Why does Paul make a point of explaining that Israel enjoyed a baptism and a spiritual meal? If Israel had been redeemed from slavery, enjoyed baptism, enjoyed a spiritual meal from Christ, but failed to enter God's rest because of unrepentant idolatry and disobedience, what makes the Corinthians think they can do the exact same thing but get different results? Isn't that the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? If God overthrew Israel, Paul writes... What makes you feel safe if your life is patterned by unrepentant sin, saint? And this is not different than the warning of the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 2, verses 1 to 4. He's already made an argument. The Son of God is far supreme. His supremacy is is far greater than that of angels who mediated the Old Covenant. He's He's the greater David. The new covenant of Christ is better in every way than the old covenant of Moses. So what's the implication? The Hebrews author writes in verses 1 to 4 of chapter 2. Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels, the old covenant, proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? If they got punished for for a covenant mediated by angels, and the Son is far far better than angels, what do you think is going to happen to you if you disobey His new covenant? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Everything has escalated from old to new. Corinthians don't understand that, or at least they've forgotten. So what's the implicit command here from Paul if he's teaching them, Israel enjoyed a form of all the things that you enjoyed. They rejected it. Committing adultery and unrepentant sin, and God overthrew them in the wilderness. They didn't reach the promised land. They didn't enter God's rest. What, what, what do you think that you're doing by doing the same in this new covenant of Christ? Christ. 
So what's the implicit command from Paul here already? Before he, he gets into really nailing Israel and the Corinthians. Live a redeemed life that pleases God. Like, Israel's a negative example. They were redeemed out of slavery to Egypt, and they disobeyed, and it displeased God, and they were overthrown. What's, what's Paul's implicit command here for the Corinthians and for us? Live, live a redeemed life that pleases the Lord. In the midst of a stern warning like this, I know myself well enough, and I know some of you saints well enough too, that you'll be tempted to despair because of the prospect of God's displeasure. And hear this good news. It's going to help us to interpret the rest of the passage. While neither the Old Covenant nor Moses' leadership could change Israel's hearts or give them rest, the work of Christ saves His people completely. The redemption of Israel through the Exodus was wonderful, but it didn't change the people. The redemption of Christ's cross is perfect. And it has secured the salvation of all of God's people. Saints, the good news of the gospel is that you have something better than a Passover lamb. You have the one to whom the Passover lamb pointed. You have Jesus Christ. And since Jesus stood in your place as your substitute on the cross under God's wrath, there is not a single ounce of God's wrath remaining for you. The gospel good news is that since Jesus was raised from the dead and has ascended to God's right hand, you have a living hope from a living king whose sovereign will cannot be thwarted. I'm just going to keep going. The Father has called you out of sin. The Son has accomplished your redemption and the Spirit has applied that salvation to your life. The, tri the, the triune God works inseparably. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Through the work of the obedient Son, Jesus Christ, we now have new hearts, new minds. We have the law of God written on our hearts. You're sealed by the Spirit. and You've been justified. You're being sanctified. You will be glorified on the last day. We enjoy God's rest in Christ. Amen. See, that's the argument of the author of Hebrews. Joshua couldn't give it, otherwise David wouldn't have talked about them, them still needing it in the Psalms. But who did Joshua point to? Christ. We enjoy God's rest in Christ. We have been made new creations in Christ, and we will enjoy the new creation to come. As sure as Christ has been raised from the dead, it's done. It's done. So, as you look at your life and, and, and Paul having the Corinthians look at their lives, the same Paul who gives this stern warning is the same Paul who would say that the good work that God started in us, he will bring to completion in Christ Jesus. Christians are, we have to understand ourselves in light of the picture painted for us by Israel in the wilderness. Like Israel being redeemed out of slavery, Christians have been redeemed out of slavery, but, but something far, far more terrible than a nation, an, opp an oppressive regime. We have been freed from the slavery of sin and death. We have been brought out of slavery. Like Israel, we're walking through the wilderness. We've enjoyed the exodus from sin, and we're walking in the wilderness, and we're headed to the promised land. We haven't gotten there yet, but God will keep us all the way. So we've got to hold these realities in tension, constantly in tension, already not yet, already not yet. If we're going to live as faithful Christians in the world today, strong warnings to endure in repentance, coupled with strong reassurances that Jesus will not lose us.
We got to hold both. So we need to walk the tightrope of balancing one, that we've been saved by grace, and two, that grace will produce the obedience in our lives that pleases God. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, Paul writes, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Philippians 2, 12 to 13. So, at the risk of being misunderstood, our good works do not save us, but we must bear the fruit of good works in our lives if we are to inherit the kingdom. Since we're new people, we now have the ability to live lives that please the Lord. But, but uh, you know, I, I can say that and say, oh, the Spirit will help you apply it. W- what pleases God? What pleases God? It's really important for us to not have God's displeasure upon us, like Israel did in the wilderness. What pleases God? Better yet, who pleases God? This is where right knowledge must inform right action, okay? This is, we, need, we need to be careful here. You know, the knowers thought that they knew things, and Paul says, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware. There is a place for knowledge. We need knowledge. Right knowledge must inform right action. So what pleases God? God's people knowing Him. Jeremiah 9, 23-24. What pleases God? A broken and contrite heart. Psalm 51, 16 to 17, Isaiah 66, 2, and the second half of 3 to verse 4. Who pleases God? The Son, Jesus Christ. The, the heavens were torn open and the Spirit descends like a dove and a voice from heaven says what? This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. Isaiah 42, 1, the servant of the Lord. This is the one in whom my soul is pleased. that, That servant of the Lord is the Son, Jesus Christ. What pleases God? Listening to the Son of God. Matthew 17, 5, the transfiguration. Voice from heaven again. This is my Son. But this time, what does he say? Listen to him. What pleases God? Obeying the Son. John 14, 15, if you love me, obey my commands. What pleases the Lord? Believing the Son. Mark 1, 15, repent and, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. John 6, 40. Romans 1, 17. What pleases the Lord? Repentance. Mark 1, 15. Luke 15, 7. God God will go after the one straying and leave the 99 because heaven will rejoice over one sinner who repents. More than 99 people who are justified in their self-righteousness. The Lord delights in repenting sinners. What pleases the Lord? Being generous, particularly to God's people. God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. What pleases the Lord? Godly speech and caring for widows and orphans. James 1, 26 to 27. What pleases the Lord? Godly husbands who live with their wives in in an understanding way. Otherwise, God will ignore their prayers. 1 Peter 3, 7. What pleases the Lord? Submissive wives with gentle and quiet spirits. Because a gentle and quiet spirit is is precious in the eyes of the Lord, Peter says. 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6. What pleases the Lord? Children who are obedient to their parents. Ephesians 6 1. My kids, write that one down. <laughs> Ephesians 6 1. What pleases the Lord? Love. Love. Mark 12 29 31. John 13 34 35. Love one another as I have loved you. 1 John 4 16. God is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 8, you can have all the spiritual gifts in the world, and if you like love, they're nothing. Do you live a life that pleases God? Just honestly, as you're giving yourself a self-assessment, looking at the things that, that 
Do please the Lord. Sing from the life of Israel what displeases the Lord. The question you ask yourself is, today am I living a life that pleases the Lord? You can't please the Father when you're disobeying the Son and grieving the Spirit. So let us, let us please the Lord by rightly responding to Paul's warning here. Which brings us to the second point. Obey God's warning so that you might live. Let's look at verses 6 to 11. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. In this section, it is very important that we understand God's divinely intended warning against four different expressions of unbelief in Israel's history. Okay? Verse 6. Now these things took place as examples for us. You see the word translated examples. In the Greek, that's tupos, which we translate as types. Now these things took place as types for us that we might not desire or lust after evil as they did. The redemption of Israel, as well as their subsequent disobedience, and being overthrown in the wilderness took place as types or as typological examples for us. So to understand what that means, we need to understand biblical typology. Okay, uh, last week I was teaching this to MDiv students at Southern Seminary in class. It's, it's a lot, but it's very important. The Bible uses the word type or anti-type in a handful of places in the New Testament. Romans 5.14, Adam is a type of Christ. Hebrews 8.5 and 9.24, the Levitical sacrificial system with its priesthood temple sacrifices is a type of Christ. 1 Peter 3.21, Noah's arks surviving the worldwide flood, that is a type of of the baptism we enjoy in Christ. Biblical typology, which is just typology without the E. Biblical typology, this is important, is divinely intended symbolism that points forward to its future fulfillment in Christ. Let me say that again. Biblical typology is divinely intended symbolism. God put it there intentionally. Why? To point forward to its fulfillment, future fulfillment in Jesus Christ. All right, this is important. Typology, typology is not allegory, okay? Typology is not allegory. Allegory is giving a meaning to a text that's totally divorcing it from its context, okay? Allegory is giving a spiritual meaning that is totally divorced from the intentions of the author. For example, in the early church, Rahab and Jericho, her scarlet cord that she wrapped at her window was pointing forward to the blood of Christ that would be shed on Calvary. No, it was not. That is allegory. It's okay to, to interpret things allegorically if it's an allegorical piece of literature. Like Pilgrim's Progress, that's allegory. You're supposed to interpret it as such. Do not interpret the Bible allegorically. That is a no-no. If I see you doing it, I'll wag my finger at you. Especially you, Robin. No allegory. Typology is not allegory. Biblical typology was intended by God because He's the divine author. 
It only works if there's one divine author across the entire canon. Biblical topology is a person, place, event, or institution that serves as, a, as an organic, predictive prophecy that points forward and finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. So that this, is, this is why it's important. Topology isn't just analogy. Paul's not just saying, oh, you know what, the, the church is kind of like Israel. Or, you know what, I'm looking at the Bible and Adam's kind of like Jesus. The uh, biblical authors are not saying that. Biblical topology means that God intentionally used Old Testament people, places, events, and institutions to point forward to Jesus so that we might understand the redemption that He provides. For example, the Exodus. Marriage. Paul's already addressed that in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. One flesh union. The Exodus. The Exodus was intentionally given in the book of Exodus to understand the kind of freedom from slavery that God would provide in Jesus. You see it in Exodus, and then the same kind of Exodus language, God delivering His people from slavery, is repeated across the canon, across the Old Testament, through the, through the prophets, and then the New Testament writers will come and say, Hosea, out of Egypt I called my son, and, and Jesus fulfilled it. Well, Hosea is talking about the Exodus. And Matthew's like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because the Exodus is fulfilled in Jesus. He brings a better Exodus. The whole point of the Exodus was for you to see that Jesus saves his people from slavery. It's divinely intended. The book of Hebrews is chock full of topology. So if you want to read some, read the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews helps you to see how Jesus fulfills the priesthood. He fulfills the temple. He fulfills the sacrificial system. He fulfills Davidic kingship. He fulfills God's promised rest, among many other things. Biblical types help us to understand Jesus and the new covenant work that it's applied to us. So the very important point that Paul makes here in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 14, and I'll get, get past what seems like an academic argument. It's not an academic because it's in the Bible. Very important part, uh, point that Paul makes here in the first 14 verses of 1 Corinthians 10 is that Israel served as a type pointing forward to us in Jesus Christ. Israel's redemption through the Exodus was given primarily as a type to show how God was to redeem His people through the work of His Son, Jesus Christ who would redeem his people from slavery to sin and death. God saved Israel out of Egypt and defeated the, the mighty powers of the world so that we would understand that Jesus will, has destroyed the cosmic powers and enemies of God who are our enemies. This, a, a, a critical purpose of Israel's existence was to be divinely intended instruction and warning for you. Okay? Paul's not looking at his Old Testament saying, you know, what would be a good example of idolatry being bad? Um, the prophets, the Exodus, wilderness generation, got it. No, Paul's saying God intentionally brought Israel through the wilderness for your instruction and sanctification. So big picture, it's important for us to know that one big part of God's plan for using Israel was to show us how we must live and what we, we must avoid after being redeemed by Jesus. If we're to understand the severity of Paul's warning here, we must also understand that the promised land is also a type pointing forward to Christ and His new creation. In other words, the promised land is meant to picture for us our salvation home, the new creation. In our text, when Paul says that God overthrew Israel in the wilderness, he means that's an intentional picture God has given you to show you saints 
that unrepentant sin will keep you from inheriting the new creation. Paul wants you to see Israel's period as exiles in the wilderness as a prophetic picture of your life. You've been exiled and and now you're headed home. None None of us have arrived yet. We're all steadily plodding, marching, falling, some of us being dragged But that's why the scripture says that we're aliens and strangers in this world. Because we're headed home. We're not there yet. Israel's time in the wilderness, therefore, is intended by God primarily to serve, to show the salvation in Christ, and to serve as our instruction for how to remain faithful to Jesus. Isn't that remarkable? Honestly. Isn't that remarkable? Like, God had your salvation in mind when He was walking with Adam and Abraham and Moses and Israel. God purposed all of Israel's history so that you could have a greater understanding of His love for you in Christ. Uh, My wife likes getting flowers because in part it reminds her that I love her. The flowers that I give her are just a shadow. Shadow of beauty that points to the beauty that she typifies. I mean, that's just husbands and wives, right? Who love each other. Israel is a shadow that reveals the beauty of Christ. Beloved, like, God gave you an entire nation, Israel. Her history, her priests, her sacrificial system, her kings, her prophets, her redemption from slavery, her spiritual meals, her covenant signs, all of it, beloved, in order to show you how much He loves you in Christ Jesus. In order to show my affections to my wife, I buy flowers that were cut from the ground and will soon die. In Christ, God has orchestrated human history. The entire redemptive storyline in order to show you, Christian, the love and salvation that He gives you in His Son. You are so loved. You are so loved in Christ. And part of the way He loves us is warning us. Look at verses 6 and 11. Now these things took place as types for us that we might not desire or lust after evil as they did. Verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. These two verses serve as bookends. Everything in between them should be interpreted by those two bookends because he's using the exact same language. The pattern of redeemed Israel's living while in the wilderness and headed to their promised rest and land was one of lusting after various evils. They were consumed and overcome by evil desires and actions. Four different ways Paul describes for the Corinthians and for us in Israel's wilderness period. First, verse 7. Israel was overthrown because of their idolatry. Therefore, we must flee idolatry. He quotes Exodus 32. People rose up, eat and drink and play. Israel makes a golden calf and claims that it's the God who saved them from Egypt because they're, they're too antsy and and won't wait for Moses to come back from the mountain top. Israel ate and drank and celebrated in the presence of this idol. Many of them were destroyed as a result. What's the context of the knowers in Corinth? They're eating and drinking and celebrating in the presence of Corinthian idols. What's Paul's warning here? Don't, Don't be idolaters as some of them were. Don't be idolaters. If Israel didn't escape destruction because of their idolatrous meal, what makes you think you're safe? If you're participating, eating and drinking and celebrating in the presence of idols and their temples, Paul wants the Corinthians to learn from Israel's bad example how to rightly repent and believe in their own context. Israel didn't make it to God's place because of idolatry. Idolatry. 
and neither will you if you play with idols. God wants His church, the people upon whom the end of the ages has come, to understand from Israel's example that if you persist in idolatry, you will not enter the promised new creation. Rather, you will experience an eschatological destruction, an end times destruction under God's displeasure and wrath. Does your life reflect the, obe- the, the disobedience and characteristics of idolatry? Beloved, you must flee idolatry. We'll get into examples of this sin next week. But you must run from anything that replaces your love for Jesus and takes its place. You must run from it. And we're going to talk in detail about this next week, but flee from idolatry because you you become what you worship. We read it in... Psalm 135 today, Psalm 115. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Don't enjoy, embrace Participate in idolatry because you will become like the idols you worship. So we, if we become what we worship, we must ask ourselves, into whose image are we being conformed? Are you being conformed to the image of Christ? Or are you becoming more and more like the idols, idols of our culture? You have to answer that. Second, verse 8. Israel was overthrown because of their sexual immorality, therefore we must flee sexual immorality. In Numbers 25, the men of Israel chase after Moabite women, and what then happens? The people, eight, bowed down to their gods. An Israelite man in the presence of the entire congregation of Israel God's presence at the tent of meeting in Numbers 25 takes a pagan Midianite woman in the presence of everybody watching and takes her to his tent. And a plague comes upon the people because of this brazen rebellion. And only when Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, the high priest, takes a spear and kills the couple in the act does God's plague then stop. Phineas turned back God's wrath from the people because he was jealous with the Lord's jealousy. The Lord tells Israel, Numbers 25, that Phineas made atonement for the people of Israel by striking down the sexually immoral, idolatrous couple. All right, so that might terrify you if you're new to Holy City Church, but welcome. <laughs> we must be killing sexual morality in us and in our local church. In the new covenant of Christ, we don't kill our sinful neighbors, but we are killing our sin. God is serious about sexual morality because sexual morality and idolatry are almost always intertwined. Paul has already said in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 that the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. You hear that stark warning and you might think, what hope is there for someone like me? The only hope for sexual sinners like you and me is the blood of Christ. I can stand here and tell you it is well with my soul, despite my past sexual immorality, because my sin, not in part, but the whole, nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. The cross is the only means of forgiveness for sexual sinners. But those of us who have tasted the salvation that Christ alone provides must live spirit-empowered lives of sexual fidelity and obedience. We were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. So we live lives of purity and holiness. Because it pleases the Lord. We keep the marriage bed holy, as the author of Hebrews says. Honor God with our bodies, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, because we have been united to Christ and are temples of the Holy Spirit. 
If you need to cut out social media, unsubscribe to streaming companies, avoid movies, get accountability software, or whatever in order to honor God with your body, do it. Do it so that, so that you'll inherit the kingdom. Like, man, I, I've, I've cut out social media. We've stopped having certain streaming services. Cut off hands, gouge eyes out so that you might inherit the promised land. Walk in repentance with other brothers and sisters here so that you might not be overthrown by God, but endure to the end. Third, read verse 9. Israel was overthrown because they put Christ to the test. Therefore, we must not put Christ to the test. In Numbers 21, the people of Israel questioned God and Moses. Why did you bring us out into this wilderness in order for us to die? Israel complained about their circumstances in the desert, their lack of desirable food, and their hatred for God's provision of manna. In other words, Israel questioned God's work of redemption, His commitment to bring His people into the promised land, and His commitment to bring good things for them. He questioned the good man that God had given to them, Moses. In asking, why have you led us out here to die? The Israelites were implicitly saying, we had a good life in our slavery before God brought us out. And they're also saying, God's just going to let us die. He's not going to keep His promises. He's not going to help us. He's either unable or unwilling to keep His promises to us. Israel belittled God's redemptive work, questioned His character and promises. They questioned God's appointed leadership. (laughs) So when Israel sinned in these ways, God sent fiery, fiery serpents to bite and destroy them. We must not imitate them. When Israel, when Israel sinned in this way, God provided salvation. Only when a bronze serpent on a pole was lifted up and the bitten Israelites looked to it, would they be saved from death. Beloved, the good news is that, man, we have, we have something better than a bronze snake being lifted up. And we have a pole of salvation Christ and Him crucified that has saved us from our sins and is far more powerful and effectual than a bronze serpent. The crucified Son of God was lifted up and all who turn their eyes to Him will be saved from sin and death and kept by God's power. But we must live obedient lives in light of what the cross achieved. We must look at Israel and learn. Psalm 78, 18, the psalmist writes that Israel tested God in their hearts by demanding food they craved. The knowers in Corinth were demanding food they craved in the idol temple. The Corinthians had become a people who were regularly making difficult life difficult for Paul, God's leader for them. Resisting Paul's leadership, ultimately they were resisting God. Beloved, uh, practical application. I'm not an apostle. I'm not the Lord Jesus. But the pastors here are, are, are God's, God's good gift to this church and spiritual leadership. So the author of Hebrews says, don't, don't make the lives of faithful pastors over you more painful than they already are. Don't make them shepherd you with groaning. That's no advantage to you. The Corinthians were a groan-worthy church. And, but I also want to say that it's okay to, it's okay to ask God questions about our suffering and hardship. I mean, you read the Psalms. Life in a desert wilderness would have been hard for the Israelites. Hunger and thirst are serious issues in a desert. But Israel clearly dealt with these serious issues in unbelief and moral rebellion. Accusing, questioning, complaining against God and Moses. It's not okay to question God's goodness or His salvation in Christ. Unbelief assumes the worst about God. 
we must continue to put off unbelief and trust the Lord. The fiery years of trial in the desert didn't excuse the Israelites from their sin of testing Christ. You are held to a much higher standard in the new covenant. Don't let the fiery trials or circumstances of your life cause you to doubt or resist God or his appointed leaders over you. Like when Moses, they're trying with a whole lot of weakness to lead you to the promised land. All right, fourth, fourth sin. Verse 10. Israel was overthrown because they grumbled against the Lord. Therefore, we must not grumble against the Lord. Lots of different instances of this in Israel's history. This grumbling. Numbers 11, number 16. That's what my grumbling sounds like. Grumbling against godly leadership, grumbling against God's provision, grumbling about the hardness of life for all forms of unbelief in Israel's life revealed through difficult circumstances. The same destroyer that killed the Egyptian firstborns destroyed grumbling Israelites. Israel found out that you're not safe from sin because you're Israel. You're safe from sin when you trust God's promises and obey Him in faith. God hates grumbling in the life of His people so much that He destroyed thousands of Israelites to help you see you shouldn't grumble. The Corinthians were complaining about Paul's preaching, his leadership, why they couldn't just follow their favorite preachers, among a host of other things. They were in real danger of enjoying the same destruction as the Israelites in the wilderness. And Paul wants them to wake up. Paul teaches that no one who professes Christ but clings to unrepentant complaining will escape the destroyer's judgment. Your parents growing up may have been unfaithful, but your parents won't be the reason you miss the kingdom. Your children may be difficult, but your kids won't be the reason you miss the kingdom. Your boss may be awful, but your boss won't be the reason you miss the new creation. Your health may be failing, but your health won't be the reason you miss the new creation. Sin. Not our circumstances is our problem. A life of patterned, unrepentant sin will be the reason that any of us miss the kingdom. Why? Because our disobedience reveals who we truly are. Our unrepentant disobedience reveals who we are. God often uses difficult, difficulty and suffering to show us who we are apart from Christ in our flesh as well as the immeasurable love and grace we have received in Him. Difficulty in life is often the crucible in which God breaks down the calcified, hardened tendencies of our flesh and remolds us into a people who are more faithfully demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. We must be careful that we don't profess to trust God's goodness and His exhaustive sovereignty and then fuss when God is using His prescribed means to bring about His promised results. And I'm guilty of this. We must be careful when that Walmart line's long and slow moving. Oh, mercy, we need to be careful when that person's driving slow in the left lane. Oh, man. In grumbling, we're ultimately grumbling against the Lord. Because he's the sovereign one. We must be a people who turn from grumbling to thanksgiving. Because we see ourselves in light of the cross. If God didn't spare his own son, but willingly gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Whether it's the grace to wait patiently in a checkout line, the grace to hold your tongue with a spouse or child, the grace to fear Him rather than to fear the unknown future, God will help you to trust Him and give thanks to Him in the midst of temptations to grumbling. Paul tells us, look at, look, look at Israel. Look at Israel. 
whom God sovereignly gave for your instruction. Don't be an idolater. Don't be sexually immoral. Don't put Christ to the test. Don't grumble against the Lord. And the Corinthians were guilty of all of them. And most weeks I go four for four. Myself. Are you flirting with unbelief and idolatry? Is your life patterned by any of these realities? We must not imitate Israel. We must repent and believe in order that we might live. We must live knowing that the Christ who saved us from idolatry, sexual morality, testing Him, grumbling, is able to keep us firmly to the end. The third point. Flee idolatry because God will keep you. Verses 12 to 14. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Paul wants the puffed up Corinthians to understand that while they're, they think they're standing firm, they're in danger of falling. Playing with idolatry, grumbling, testing Christ, sexual morality isn't a sign of strength, but of sinful unbelief. We need to make sure that we're standing on the solid ground of the gospel. Otherwise, God will cut us down like the Israelites in the wilderness. But the new covenant work of Christ, as I've mentioned, isn't like the old covenant of Moses. Christ actually secures our salvation. The Spirit seals us for the day of salvation. That's the new covenant. So when we hear these strong warnings, when we hear these strong warnings from Paul, and we hear his encouragement in verse 13, how are we to rightly interpret it? Because verse 13 I mean, it's hotly debated. People are all over the map. But we, when we look at verse 14, we see that Paul calls the people my beloved. And he also says, therefore. Okay? Those two, those two features of that verse need to help us understand verse 13. What does Paul say? Put another way, with a therefore, Paul says, my beloved, flee from idolatry because no temptation has overtaken you. That is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. In our context, Paul is warning the Corinthians against following the model of disobedient Israel who did not endure, did not reach the promised land. If Israel serves as a type for our example, Paul is warning the Corinthians that they need to flee idolatry in order to inherit the new creation. If they don't flee idolatry, they'll be destroyed. And he's talking to saints, Christians, not possible Christians, not people who think that they're Christians and actually aren't. He's talking to Christians. So how are we to understand this warning? God's warning is the means by which Christians endure. Hearing the strong warning is the means by which God keeps us. Shaking us up. And verse 13 is God's promise that He will keep His people from succumbing to idolatrous apostasy. He will keep you from falling away. That's the sin that you're going to be tempted to at various points in your life to fall away from the Lord. And what is Paul saying? God is faithful and He will keep you in the midst of a temptation to run away from Christ to other gods. Why? Because we are new covenant believers who have been changed from the inside out, secured by the work of Christ applied by the Spirit. God will not let you fall away. He will always provide an escape and will always cause you to endure. And it's remarkable that in all of this, God takes the initiative. And our salvation... And in our endurance, God is faithful. He will keep you. God elected you from eternity past. God promised to send a son who would crush the serpent's head. God promised a redeemer who would serve as your representative and substitute. God would save you from sin and death. 
God sent his son while you were an enemy. God has reconciled you to himself through the blood of his son. God pulled you out of darkness and put you in the light. God has given you the gift of faith and secured your endurance. In every aspect of the atonement, God has shown that he is faithful. And he will keep you. He will keep you. Some of you might doubt, am I a Christian? And if your life, like Israel, is wholly given to lusting after evil, then you do need the Lord to save you. But some of you are Christians, and, and, and you're like, I, I can't be a Christian. I must not be a Christian. If you're one who looks at Israel's sins, and then you look at your sins, and you ask, how, how, could, I, how could I be a Christian? If you truly belong to Christ, God will keep drawing you back to the gospel. He'll keep drawing you back to faith and repentance. It may be super ugly and weak, and He is dragging you back. But He will keep drawing you back because God is faithful. You're saved, beloved, not because of the strength of your faith, but because Christ died for your sins. And He's risen. It's accomplished. May God help us to continue to turn from dead idols to the living Christ and keep us believing that because he's faithful, we are forever safe. Let's pray.